going to talk about the water walker. The water walker. Say that one more time. The water walker. Yeah, that'll remind you of what uh, today's message is about. We're going to talk about uh, one of Jesus' amazing miracles, the calming of the storm after the walking on the water from chapter 6 of Mark. We've been making our way so rapidly through the book of Mark. We're already up to uh, chapter 6, kind of ending chapter 6. Yeah, yeah, we've just been flying, right? <laughs> We've been just enjoying the ride and watching God at work. Last week, we spent most of our time thinking about the most famous of Jesus' miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. It was really the feeding of the 20,000, but it was 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So the, the, the crowd was huge, and it made an amazing impression, not only on Jesus' disciples, but on the, uh, the crowd the followers that were following after Jesus for miracles. As we spend time today, we're going to look at this uh, incident, another example of Jesus' power and his might, but also a connection for us as we think about the healing that he's able to do and the power that he has over our storms, over the... Uh, challenges, the struggles, the th wind and the waves that so often cause us difficulty and cause us to be challenged. One of the things that happened after the uh, feeding of the 5,000, the book of Matthew says, people came to Jesus and um, wanted to make him king by force. They wanted to thrust him into the seat of revolution, the seat of rebellion and bring about an army that would overthrow Rome and the other leaders that were resistant to the Messiah. So they came to uh, intending to come to make him king by force, and Jesus was in the exact opposite mode. He was there to bring about an eternal, everlasting, and spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom that they were expecting. And that's partly where this clash is kind of coming from. Let's um, read together this uh, Mark chapter 6. It's not forwarding. There you go. We're starting at verse 45. And immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up to the mountainside to pray. Later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They had cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, there's that word again, starts the passage. We keep getting that word immediately from Mark. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were, approximate, they were completely amazed for they had not understood the loaves understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. When they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And whenever he went into the villages, towns, and countrysides, they placed the sick in the marketplace. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Let's just bow in prayer for a minute. Thank you for your word, Heavenly Father. Thank you for the lessons we can learn from this encounter. Thank you for showing us through the disciples a response to you. Help us to be um, honoring and worshiping and trusting instead of fearful. Thank you for calling us in the middle of a storm 
to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's still not forwarding. There we go. I brought up some of the background information and just thinking about how, in a way, tired and, and uh, worn the disciples were. They had been sent out two by two to share God's word, to heal, to do what Jesus had been doing. And they came back and gave a report, and they were pretty elated about the report. They were excited about what was taking place. And then to see the Lord multiply fish and bread for thousands and thousands of people left them with an with a amazing understanding. They were trusting to some degree who God was, but they'd not yet latched on to the full degree of who Jesus was and what he was about and how it was going to affect their, their lives. They were also battling that. I'm not sure what. There we go. I mentioned this. They were also battling the expectations and the confusion that the crowds had about Jesus. They're hearing all of these um, followers that had just been fed this amazing meal saying that they were going to take Jesus by force, intending to make him king by force and throwing off the Roman government. There was a definite um, swell of interest in that. In the meantime, Jesus is wanting to teach them yet another lesson, dig deeper in their growth and their faith to put their trust at test through it all. So you have this wind and waves imagery. You have a storm out on the Sea of Galilee, the, the Sea of Gennesaret, which was really more of a lake than a, than a sea. We could equate that today with, uh, with just struggles, the storm and the storms of life. Anybody here today know what it means to go through a storm of life, not just on a lake, but in difficulties, struggles, Storms that we would say, maybe uh, storms at work. Anybody ever have any challenges at work? Okay. Heard about that on the way in as people kind of kind of shared. How about some health issues? Um, just heard today about a woman who discovered breast cancer. Doesn't know what it's going to mean, but it's in the lymph nodes. And you just hear this, they're going through a storm. There's a challenge. There's some upset. There's wind and waves there that are blowing and causing challenge. Anybody ever had a financial storm? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Anybody had a financial storm? I can see a few hands there. Don't raise your hand if you don't want to. Um, with the, uh, today's, oh, what do they call it, Bidenomics? I think they're talking about those difficulties in finances just in making it and making it work. Let's give this guy a hand. Is he wonderful? Yeah. He knows I have trouble if, I, if the technology doesn't work. I'm in trouble. But how about you? Are you in trouble? Finances can do that. Finances can be a storm for us. And sometimes they're a storm of our own making. Why did I do that? Sometimes there's a storm outside of our own making. That's just part of our culture or part of our um, neighborhood or part of what we're facing. Sometimes it's very personal and relational. Today, as we entered into uh, our time together, several people kind of gave little reports on how's their marriage doing because they've been through a marriage storm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For some, it's they need to be reconciled to a loved one or a relative. And it's been years that the storm has been raging and they're not sure where it's going to go. So we all face those kinds. Jesus said it. In this world, you will have trouble. We could just add that word. In this world, you will have storms. Storms will take place. And whether you are a believer in Jesus or not a believer in Jesus, you need to hear this the storms will still take place. I mean, think about it for a minute. You've got Jonah, 
who had a storm because he was disobedient to Christ, to God. He was going the opposite direction of the way God called him. And he faced a storm of correction. But you've got others, like Job, who had a storm really to test and to, 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 to test out his faith and his trust in God. It wasn't because of his disobedience. It was rather up in heaven was this amazing uh, struggle between good and bad, evil and God. And he was allowed to go through a storm in his life, such a storm that you and I have never faced. And he ended up faithful. What did he say? The Lord gives and the Lord, blessed be the name of the Lord. So you've got all kinds of storms and struggles, some of which are of our own doing, some of which are to correct us and discipline us, and some of which are just to to test us and to grow our faith, like Job. What did he end up at the end of his life? Same Job, greater faith, more trust. Yeah, that's the storm role. Some people are begging God to change their circumstances. And that's their their whole mode. When in reality, sometimes God's wanting to use those circumstances, the storm of your life, to grow your faith, to boost your heart, to empower you for more trust in Him. That's the idea behind these storms. And here is Jesus walking on the water, blessing His disciples Let's tear that apart a little bit. Let's tear this passage apart and pull out a couple of principles that we can follow. The first one is, jot this down, insert this word if you can in the outline. Jesus often calls people or sends people into the storm. You're like, oh great, I didn't want to hear that one. In a world where we often teach people that, hey, if you just accept Christ, you'll never have a problem again. It'll all be roses. Everything will be easy. And some people appeal to others based on that. That's not what Jesus does. He, in this case, he sends his disciples out into a storm. What kind of Christ is this? What kind of God is this? He sends them into conditions that are going to turn out to be a storm. Wisdom in the long run. Trust God's overall view and his leadership. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples. Look at that word. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. They're tired. They've been through all kinds of things. He says, Get in the boat and go across the lake. I'll meet you over there. He made them get in the boat. Now, knowing what's going to come, does that leave you a little um, question mark? How could he do that? The very thing that's yet to come will tell us how he could do that. He calls you and he calls me into life, into action, into the storm at the very time that we don't expect it or don't want it. It's the least welcomed times that often the storms come and test our faith. It's a, you know, later that night, the boat's in the middle of the lake. This is yet to come. He was alone on the land. Jesus stays by himself on the land while he sends the disciples out in the boat. Eventually he'll be in the boat, but at this point he's alone on the land. Shortly before dawn, we we understand it's the fourth watch of the night. The Romans had divided their their watches up. The fourth watch was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. That was the fourth watch. It's sometime in that time frame, shortly before dawn. You know how it's uh, darkest before dawn? Now that's the section. That's the time frame. He says shortly before dawn, he went out to them. But he sent them ahead of time. He sent them on beforehand. The wind was against them. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. You know, Jesus sent the disciples across the lake. He sent all the people away. 
The people that were there for food and were just following him because he could heal them, he, the Bible says he sent them away, but he sent the disciples in the opposite direction. I'm just thinking for a minute about how so often he sends the crowd one way, or the way the crowd is going is one way, and the way his disciples are going is another. What's the way the disciples were going? Where Jesus commanded them. Where Jesus called them. Where Jesus made them go, so to speak. How could he make them get in the boat? Because they trusted him. Now we're talking about former fishermen here. We're talking about people who knew boats, who knew this lake, who knew the Sea of Galilee. We're talking about quite a bit of experience in the boat, and yet that's where Jesus wants them to be tested. He wants them to be um, tried. He wants them to overcome this, this storm. Don't follow the crowd. Follow Jesus. Because they were in the boat, they had this experience with Jesus that nobody else on the shore had. There are definitely times when we see the storm coming. Sometimes those storms are because of sin, but sometimes they are just because we're in the world. We have other examples in the scriptures. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they faced opposition because they were faithful, because they didn't compromise. Daniel, he faced the lion's den because he didn't compromise. Storms can come because of faithfulness. But we have a lot of examples where storms just follow. The Apostle Paul, he's on his way, missionary journeys, and what throws him off course? A storm. Later he finds out it was all in God's best plan for him. But at the time, storms confuse. Storms frustrate. But realize, sometimes, for a believer, Jesus is sending you into a storm to learn a lesson. He's sending you into a storm to grow your faith. Sometimes he's sending you into a storm to reach somebody else and to, to, to grow the kingdom of God. Well, let's talk a little deeper here. Jesus not only sends his disciples into storms, he sees, he views, the Bible says, he tuned in to the disciples in the storm. Did you catch that? After leaving them, he went up on a mountain to pray. <laughs> Evidently, this mountain is able to view the entire lake, and he is praying while he's up on this mountain. And Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. He saw them. Meditate on that for a minute. Jesus saw them. Jesus knows. The Bible talks about Jehovah El Roy. That's the God who sees. The God who sees. He sees everything. He knows what is taking place. Jesus is by himself in prayer on a mountain looking out at his disciples on the sea. It's a perfect perspective. By the way, that's what this is all about. Is Jesus' perspective is different than the apostles' perspective. They're seeing the storm from the boat. He's seeing the storm from the mountain. Realize that's always God's perspective. He sees the bigger picture. He knows the, the um, better landscape, the perspective. He saw them struggling because of the storm. Where they started, he could see. Where they were at, he could see. And where they were to go, he could see. Thinking again about Job, we get to see behind the scenes in the book of Job. As God shows the picture of him dealing with the evil one and the evil one saying, I'm going to throw Job into a trial, into a storm, so to speak. And God could see the bigger picture. And we get to, as we read the book, see the bigger picture. But Job didn't see it. He was dealing with it one step at a time. He was dealing with it in the middle of the storm. And so 
We need to get God's perspective. We need to realize God's perspective is seeing above and beyond. What was God doing? What was Jesus doing up on the mountain? He was talking to the Lord. Let me put it this way. Jesus speaks or prays for his disciples. Oh, folks, to just think about it for a minute. Jesus is interceding for you and for me as we go through the trials, the struggles, the tribulations in this life. We are not left to ourselves. He is speaking for us. He is praying for us. He goes up on this mountain and intercedes for them. I put up this uh, verse. He went out for them. He saw them straining and he prayed for them. Romans 8, follow this one because Jesus is our intercessor. It says here, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how did he not also, will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God. Catch this, underline this, and is also interceding for us. What's that mean? Jesus is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. He's speaking for us. He's praying for us. Remember John chapter 17? Jesus is in the garden, and what's on his mind are the believers, or the church. He's praying for them. He says, I don't just pray for the disciples. I pray for those who will believe on me through their, through their word. He's praying for you and for me. He's praying for the body of Christ. That's what's on Jesus' heart. Realize it today. Whatever storm or winds or adversities or trials or tribulations you're going through, he's praying for you. He's lifting you. He is interceding. If he's interceding for us, what do we have to be worried about? How can we be so concerned when he's praying for us? He is speaking to the Heavenly Father on our behalf for us. In the middle of the storm, Christ is interceding for us. When we're at our worst, whatever we need, whether it's hope or wisdom or healing, or relationships, this is a picture of our lives. This wind and waves, when the waves are there. Jesus, it's like he's on the mountain looking out over the sea, and he is like that in our lives. He has a better perspective. Trust his, he would not put you in the situation you're in if he didn't think you could grow through it, if he didn't want you to progress, if he didn't want your faith to grow strong through the middle of this uh, wind and waves. It's the picture of our lives. Jesus on the mountain praying for those of us in the valley those of us that are living out our lives or in the storm. Let's take another one here, number four. Jesus satisfies his disciples in the storm. He meets their deepest need and their greatest um, need with himself. He is the answer in the storm. I put it this way. Jesus is the greatest need we all have. When we're going through a storm, he wants to provide us. What did I say earlier? Wisdom, power, ability, healing, his touch. He satisfies that through his own person. Jesus is our greatest need. Look at some of these um, verses that come up. He saw his disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against him. Shortly before dawn, he went out walking on the lake. He was about to pass by. Underline that. We're going to look at that, tear that apart for a minute. The disciples must have felt all alone at this time, but he's about to pass by them. I don't think to trick them or anything, but just he's about to go past, and he's going to show them through in his experience 
a example that's used in the Old Testament. In fact, I've got a couple of Old Testament scriptures that highlight this word, pass by. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage, it is I. The answer to their need was Jesus saying, take courage, it's me, it is I. Don't be afraid. Don't be so, so frightened. You see, if you go back to the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 33, when God wanted to show Moses who he was, Moses wanted to know, how can I share who you are? He passes by. Notice what it says. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. He's going to show him a glimpse of himself. He said, I will proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. I have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you will stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, circle that. That's what he's alluding to in this passage on the lake. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until what? Until I have passed by. That's the terminology that's used. The next, the next um, chapter, he, he shows how it works itself out. And he, the Lord, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving the wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed down to the ground and worshiped the Lord. This is the place of worship. The passing by of God led to the worship of the Lord. This was the cause for worship for Moses and eventually for all God's people. One more passage that brings this up in the Old Testament. This is from Kings. This is in the life of Elijah. Elijah, one of the prophets of God, asked the same kind of question. Lord, I want to see more of you. I want to know you deeper. I want to sense who you are. Here's what it says in 1 Kings. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to catch that? pass by. Same phraseology that's used in the New Testament for Jesus and the disciples. Jesus is going to pass by as here the Lord is about to what? Pass by. Then a great and powerful wind. <laughs> great and powerful wind. We've got wind and waves, don't we? This water walker is finding this back in the Old Testament. Powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. You know this passage. And after the earthquake was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came what? A gentle word, a gentle whisper. And guess what? <laughs> Elijah, when he heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. God was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. He was not in the wind. He was in the gentle, still, small voice. So often, that's the way it is with God. When he passes by, we sense a different presentation of God than we've ever experienced before. That's what's taking place with Jesus walking on the water. He's about to pass by. Like God passed by for Moses, like God passed by for Elijah, and to reveal himself in a brand new way. He just revealed himself in the feeding of the 5,000, but now he's going to reveal himself in a different way that's going to really get through to the disciples once and for all. 
Jesus says to them, and immediately, take courage, it is I. And what's he do? He climbs into the boat with them, and the winds die down. What they needed was the presence of Christ in their, in their boat, in their life, in their storm. And they're completely amazed. The water, the um, waves die down, and they're completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. They hadn't gotten the message. They had not understood. What? Who could not understand about the loaves? Well, they missed it. But now they're getting it. This is the first time that the disciples bow down in worship. The Matthew version shows in the boat, as Jesus gets in, it says they worshiped him as the son of God. Up till now, they hadn't gotten that deep. They hadn't gotten that. They knew he was a miracle worker, but they hadn't realized to the degree that they are here that he was the powerful son of God. They bowed down and worshiped him. See, he is the one we need most in the storm. He's the one we can say, truly, he is the son of God. Number five, let's talk about that. Jesus stays with you or with me, with us. He stays with you through the storm. He is with you. He's not just at a distance on a mountain praying for you. He's actually with you in the boat. This fourth watch of the night before dawn comes, he goes out to them walking on the water. He entered the wind and waves. He entered the storm and ministered to the disciples. While they were walking on the water, he went saw the himself walking on the, they thought he was a ghost. What was it about Jesus? No, no human being is going to be walking on water. You just say, there's something weird going on here, right? Right? He was walking on water. They cried out in fear, the Bible says, in terror, because they saw him and they were terrified. Jesus immediately speaks to them. He doesn't allow that fear to last long. He ministers to them. Now he's in the boat. He cries out and says to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. What's taken them from terrified to amazed? What's well, taken them from afraid to faithful and worshipful that they saw Jesus in the boat. He joined them where they were at. So often in our world, it's the fourth watch of the night. It's the darkest before dawn. It's like when the um, energy is at the lowest. It's when the encouragement is needed the most. We need to turn our hearts to the Lord. Turn, trust in him at those darkest hours and apply to your life and to my life that it's at that time when we need him the most. He got into the boat. Another phrase that's used here when he says, it is me, trust me, I am. It's the same phrase that's used for Describing God, Moses says, who should I say has sent me? Tell them the I am has sent you. That's the phraseology that's here when he says, take courage, it is I, I am. He's using that same phraseology here. Don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Even in the midst of a storm, because Jesus is going to stay with you. He will watch you. He will protect you. He will guard you. It is I. Don't be afraid. Two more to think about. Second to last one. He will save you through this process. He will save you. He is with you and he will lead you through the storm. Trust him. 
He's got your back. He's got your front. He's got both sides. He's got you in the palm of his hand. What did God, Jesus say about the Father? He's, he's got you in the palm of his hand and nothing can snatch you from him. He's got you. Jesus will indeed save you through the storm to the end. These guys have been through eight hours of struggle in this process of going across the lake. And Jesus gets in the boat and all of a sudden the storm subsides. The storm calms. No longer is the wind and waves, are the wind and waves against him. It stops completely. That's the uh, example for us of how the following the Lord will end with good. Do you believe that in your life? Do you believe the storms you're going through, if you trust in God, if you allow Christ to lead you through them, will end with good? That's the story of Job. Really, in a way, that's the story of Jonah. That's the story of Moses and Elijah. <laughs> All these examples we're showing today, every one of them can end with joy and good. We haven't used this for a while. Romans 8, 28, you know it. It's a, it's a classic. For God, for we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. God will work for good. Whatever you're going through, he will take the storm of your life. He will take the wind and the waves that are blowing you. And he will turn those what? For Good. He works for the good. Do you believe that? Amen? God will indeed lead you through that. He will lead you through the storm and for the good. I love the confidence in that. For we are confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of righteousness. God will work for the good. One version says, for we know that God works for the good for all those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now we'd want to end there because we want to end with what's good. But the scripture goes a little bit further. The scripture points out that there are still others that he wants to serve through your victory in the storm. He wants to take your victory in the storm and allow others to be introduced to the kingdom, to the victory that you've had. Jesus is for others in the storm. Jesus is for others. Don't just look at it as a selfish thing. Well, I made it through. But let God use your life and making it through to reach other people for him. Look what the scripture says happens. Verse 56. Wherever he went, into the villages and towns and countrysides, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The healing was, to de was designed to continue. God was wanting to use that healing to make those storms profitable. He wants to use the storm in your life, not just to put you back on track, not just to calm the wind and waves down, but to let others be drawn to him like these were, like these folks were. Storms are all around us. There are needs in every one of our lives and our families. Jesus wants us to trust in him. He wants to use storms in our lives to bring others to him. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this model, this example of how you have shown yourself strong in the midst of storms. Thank you that your apostles and disciples were faithful to you and learned such a good lesson. Thank you that we today can as well learn an amazing lesson about you. Thank you that you not only see and pray for us through the storms, but that you approach us very personally and directly, that you are a part, you're in their boat, Thank you, Lord, for that. Would you show us more and more ways today, this week, this month, this season, how you want us to draw others to you because the way you're leading us victoriously through storms today. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you for calling us to yourself. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.